Now, Solomon, then you've gone too far. Last week, we saw that King Solomon was disgusted with, you know, with the labors of his life. He kept on, he had the attitude of that he did all this work and somebody else was going to enjoy it. That he had to leave it to somebody else that he wasn't going to be able to do. I mean, you know, don't, don't feel bad for Solomon. He had more money than anyone in the world. It wasn't like he was missing out on things. He came to that conclusion. He just said, you know what, that uh, he's going to do all this stuff and then yet somebody else is going to enjoy it. Plus the fact that we saw foolishness of, of, you know, that there are people out there that will get mad at you for working hard. That they're going to be mad at you that are going to say, well, it must be nice that they, got, they went out and they bought this, or they got this, or they got that. And they say, it must be nice, while they're folding their hands, just sitting off to the side, doing nothing. That they're actually, it, they want the same things that you have, but they don't want to do the work. And so, we see along with those things, you know, plus, we just, you know, came to the overall conclusion that life isn't fair. That things will happen in your life that are not fair. There are times, you know, where I've sat, you know, I've sat down and, and uh, I have different family members come up to me and will ask, you know, let's say, well, why is this happening to you? Are, you know, you're a pastor or you're a Christian. Why is this happening to you? You know, why have you had to have two hernia surgeries in the past five years? You know, why have you had this crash on, on your side? And you say, you know what? Life isn't fair. The Bible says the, the, the rain will fall upon the just and the unjust. It does not matter, you know, along those lines. But yes, you know, um, we cannot get to the point to where Solomon does, where he just, you know, just kind of almost hates everything. But he gets to that point, and that's why I say uh, when we went through it, you know, there's certain times where Solomon have this, this, like, dip where he goes down, and we got to, like, look at it from all of God's Word, not just from his perspective, because, yes, the Bible records exactly what Solomon said, but are his thoughts always, you know, true? No, he's not God, right? And so we need to, you know, uh, you know weigh in upon, you know, with God's Word. We need to uh, take Scripture and define it with Scripture and say, okay, this is actually what God's Word means here, right? And so Ecclesiastes chapter 5. This morning I want to talk to you for a few moments. I've I since have changed my title. I've changed my title three times. This is the third time this morning that, you know, that I've changed it. Um, I it started off, you know, uh, calling it Promises, Promises, and then I said, well, think before you speak, and then this morning, I, uh, you know, just changed it in my chair and said, let thy words be few. I feel like th that one, you know, is more appropriate, let thy words be few. So e Ecclesiastes chapter 5, starting at verse 1, the Bible reads, keep thy foot when thou goest to the house of God, and be ready to hear than to give the sacrifice of fools, for they consider not that they do evil. Be not rash with thy mouth, and let not thine heart be hasty to, uh, to utter anything before God, for God is in heaven, and up, uh, thou upon the earth. Therefore, let thy words be few. For a, a dream uh, cometh through the multitude of business, and a fool's voice is known by a multitude of words. When thou, uh, when thou vowest a vow unto God, de defer not to pay it, for he hath no pleasure in fools. Pay that which thou hast avowed. Better is it that thou shouldest not vow than, than thou shouldest vow and not pay. Verse 6, Suffer not thy mouth to cause thy flesh to sin, neither say, uh, neither say uh, you before the angel that it was an error. Wherefore, should, uh, should God be angry at thy voice and destroy the work of thy, uh, thine hands? For in the multitude of dreams and many words, there are also uh, uh, diverse vanities. But fear thou God. If thou seest the oppression of the, of the poor and uh, violent uh, perverting of, the, of judgment and justice in a province, uh, marvel not at, at the matter. For he that is higher than the highest regardeth, and there be higher than they. Moreover, the prophet of the earth is for all. The king himself is, uh, is served by the field. He that loveth silver shall not be satisfied with silver, nor uh, he that loveth abundance with increase. This is also vanity. When, uh, when goods increase, they are increased that eat them. And, and uh, what good is there uh, to the owners thereof uh, saving, saving the beholding of them with their eyes. The sleep of a laboring man is sweet, whether uh, he eat little or much, but the abundance of the rich will not suffer him to sleep. 
there is a there is a, a sore evil I have seen under the sun, namely, riches uh, kept uh, from uh, for owners thereof to their hurt, for those uh, those riches perish by evil travail, and he uh, that begetteth a son, and there is nothing in his hand. Verse fifteen, and he came uh, came forth from his mother's womb naked. Uh, shall he return uh, to return to go as he came? And shall uh, take nothing of his labor, which he uh, he made he may carry uh, carry away in his hand. And this is also a sore evil, that in all points as he came, so shall he go. And what profit hath he that hath uh, labored for the wind? All all his days also he eateth in darkness, and he hath uh, much sorrow and wrath with uh, his sickness. Behold uh, that uh, behold that which I have seen is good and comely for one to come and eat, come to eat and to drink, and to enjoy the good of his, all his labor that he taketh under the sun all the days of his life which God uh, gives him, for, he is, for it is his portion. Every man also to whom God hath given riches and wealth and hath given uh, him power to eat thereof and to take uh, his portion and to rejoice in his labor, this is the gift of God. For he shall, he shall not much remember the days of his life, because God answered, uh, answered him in the joy of his heart. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, I thank you for your word. Lord, I pray that the seed of thy word would fall upon fertile soil this morning, upon our hearts, that we would not only be hearers of your word, but doers of your word. God, that you would fill me with your spirit, that I would speak your truth in Jesus' name. Amen. As we, you know, see, as we see from this, we see a changing of, of King Solomon. King Solomon in, in, verse, you know, in chapter 4, remember he was, he was mad because everybody you know, was going to benefit off of all of his hard work. This time we, we begin to see the fact of how he's changing, but it's not going to be until towards the end of chapter 5 that we see that changing. But what we're going to see here, there's a quote by uh, Benjamin Franklin that I think oftentimes, you know, uh, that we can see, we see this especially when it's political. Performance will turn them into enemies. Promises may get thee friends, but not performance will turn them into enemies. We obviously see this in, you know, in the political realm because what do they do? Every politician comes out, they make promises that they intend to keep. So they come out and they, they give lip service. They talk all these. They talk the talk. They do all these things, and everybody gets excited. They say this person is going to bring about change. The only, there's only one person on, only one president I think of in the past 20 years that had promised change and actually brought change, and it was not the change that we wanted. And I'm not going to say who that one is, but I'm just going to tell you that those are the things is that we can make promises, but we need to keep those promises. That's what we're going to see here uh, uh, this morning. Number one is this, promises made. Promises made. Let's look at verses uh, 1 through 3. It says, Keep thy foot when thou goest to the house of God, and be, uh, be more ready to hear than to give the sacrifice of fools. For they consider not that they do evil. Be not rash with thy mouth. And let not, uh, thine heart be hasty to utter anything before God. For God is in heaven... And thou upon the earth. Therefore, let thy words be few, for a dream uh, comes through the multitude of business, and a fool, a fool's voice is known by a by a multitude of words. Obviously, you know the first eight verses that I'm going to go through is where I'm going to spend the majority of my time. I will get to the other verses, but the majority of my time will be upon these eight, uh, the first eight verses. I'm going to go with the first three here. But where he talks about it says, "Keep thy foot." That means that when you go to the house of God, that you hold or you, re, you retain your stance upon his word and his promises. That you trust that God's word is 100% true, amen? That you're going to the house of God to hear God's word preached, right? You're, hearing, you're going in there saying, I want to hear truth, and that can only come from God's word. That's why you go to church, right? I don't think that you went to Brother Doug's class, go, you're going, man, I'd like to hear Doug's you know, opinion. Or, you know, I want to hear, you know, pastor's, you know, opinion this morning about, no, you want to hear the Bible. You want to hear truth. 
And the thing is, is that oftentimes people will go to the house of God and they, you know, they don't go for truth. They go so they can hear what they want to hear. You know, or that the pastor will, you know, will come out and will say what they want them to say. Because the pastor doesn't want to hurt their feelings. I don't have to hurt your feelings. The Bible will do that on its own. Okay? If we, if we sit there and, you know, I'm sitting there worrying about whether or not I'm going to hurt your feelings or not, I'm going to sit there and be tiptoeing all around. And the thing is, is that when we come into the house of God, we should realize and know that sometimes our, foot, uh, you know, our feet will get stepped on. Right? Because truth will do that. Truth will hurt at times. It says, be more ready to hear than to give. Uh oh. Pastor, did you just have, you know, take up an offering? But what does the Bible says for us to do? It says, be more ready to hear God's word than to give. Because you have people coming to church all the time making promises. It says, the Bible calls it a sacrifice of fools, it's empty promises. You have people go into churches and say, you know what, if God, if you do this, I'll do this for you. Or God, if I do this or this or that, God, then I'll do, you know, then this will be. And the thing is, is that, what does it say? It says, they don't consider that they do evil. That when we come, if we come into church with an empty promise, it's getting a little bit quieter now, but if we come. God calls it a sacrifice of fools. He says that you do evil when you do those things. This is one of the reasons some people come up to me for the past seven years and say, Pastor, why are you not really into giving altar calls? This would be one reason why. Because oftentimes an altar call is what? It's an emotional response to God's word. You say, well, yes, a person should have a time to respond to God's word. I agree. But oftentimes it's done in the heat of the moment. And by the time you get out the door, you've already forgot what you just you know, promised God that you're going to do. We're flipping with those things. And so the time I have given an altar call, I've made sure that it's, I mean, as much as I can. I can't, you know, sit dictate what comes out of your mouth. But I try to make sure that the subject that I'm speaking on is pretty plain and clear that there's, no, you know, hopefully that there's no way that somebody can sit there and say, hey, maybe I'm like, I want to, you know, put my trust in you. I want to get saved today. Hopefully that altar call is, you know, is met with, yeah, well, I didn't really mean that. Hopefully it's never met with that, right? So we, you know, people oftentimes, you know, we get flippant with our words. Do we not? We say things that we don't mean. Say, you know, like, uh, or, or, you know, we could come along. And one of the things that I, I, I hear kids, you know, oftentimes say, I hear this, you know, is, I didn't mean that. Well, how many times did, do we make a promise to the Lord and flip it in that area and saying, God, I didn't really mean that. But you made a promise to God that you would do it. I mean, we, you, you hear this all the time. Just, you know, like I, I just kind of alluded to, God, I will do this if you do this for me. This is kind of like how Martin Luther was. Martin Luther did this as well, and Martin Luther is, he's not the example, you know, like a good example to follow. That's what he was going to do. He's going to go be a lawyer, got into a, you know, uh, got caught in a thunderstorm on his way home, and said, God, if you may, because he was deathly afraid of, of thunderstorms. Anybody afraid of thunderstorms? Okay, who loves thunderstorms and like rainstorms? I enjoy them. I, I sleep like they right through them. I'm just, except for the occasional one that gets super loud, then I'm like, okay, oh, okay, it's raining now, I'm good. And then I fall right back to sleep. But he was deathly afraid of thunderstorms, did not like, you know, thought it was like the voice of God. And so he said, God, if I make it through this thunderstorm, I will go into the ministry. Yes, he, he kept his promise, but that's not the kind of you know, promises you my entire vocation that I was going to do, what I've been going to school for, just so, you, you know, like I don't, what I'm perceiving in an emotional moment. Was he going to die? Most likely not. But that's what he did. Or the thing of, I will never do this again. 
never do this again, God, if you get me out of this. This is probably one of the ones that's spoken of probably most at prison. Because you'll have a, you know, one saying, God, if you get me out of this. Or the you know, fact of if a marriage is like endangered. Like there's, you know, you know, both spouses are at each other's throat and say, God, if you get me out of this, then I'll do this. Or God, if you make this better, if you change my spouse, God, then I'll, I'll live my life for you. I've, I've heard that one before. Not personally, you know, like you, my wife and I, but I've heard it in, you know, people making that comment. I don't want any rumors going out there and be like, oh. Or the other one, this is the ultimate one that should never be spoken. I'll never sin again. Or I'll never do that sin again. You can't make that promise. That's a promises to get, you know, oftentimes these are also promises to get someone's like, you know, agenda accomplished. They make a promise because they know what people want to hear, and so then they go ahead and they make a promise, right? But he's saying that this should definitely not happen in the house of God. Think about it. In, in Matthew chapter 12, verse 36 to 37, Jesus said about this, about every idle word or every flippant word. He says, I say unto you that every idle word that man shall speak, they shall give an account thereof in the day of judgment. For by thy words thou shalt be justified, and by thy uh, judge every idle word and here's the thing i don't think that we mean to say a lot of flippant words or anything but i think it's because we want to be heard sometimes we foolishly because we just want to be heard sometimes we do stuff goofy or something strange or out of the ordinary why because we just want to be heard But we don't want to listen to those with much more wisdom. There are ones in our life that God has I'm going to let my words be few and listen to the ones that have wisdom. And, you know, it used to be said that if you had gray hair, you had wisdom. But sometimes I'm finding that just because you have gray hair does not mean you're wise. Wisdom comes in all shapes and forms. James chapter 1, verses 19 and 20 says, Wherefore, slow to wrath, for the wrath of man worketh not the righteousness of God. There's a lot more wisdom in that, right? Because how many times have you, have you, uh, have, I sit there and think to myself, have I gotten angry and spoke and then thought about it five, ten minutes later and said, I should have kept my mouth shut? Am I the only one that's ever thought that? But that's the whole thing is, is that, when you know it's when we get to, to that point where we we get so angry and then we open up our mouth and then just whatever floods out comes out of our mouth that uh, you know being established or being effective in that person's life that I'm getting angry with but if I'm slow to speak, if I'm slow to wrath, and I'm quick to listen, or I'm swift to listen, and maybe hear why right? It's getting quieter. I'm using me as an example here. You got to be men in on this. Thank you.
when we're, you know, being We want to be heard, no matter what volume it is. We are going to, we are not going to hear the real reason why that, you know, the, the, hear the reason, nor let alone hear the voice of God on what to do in that situation. We're not only going to miss the fact of how to you know, speak into that person's life or you know, how to encourage that person. We're not going to be able to hear what God's speaking to us. Because how does God's voice come? In a still, small voice. God's word says, be still and know that I am God. God's still small voice, that's how he's going to speak to you. But if we're so angry and we come across in that way and we don't want to listen and we just want to spew whatever comes out, we're not going to hear his voice. God doesn't need our empty promises either. He doesn't need empty promises. We get those from politicians. He wants, you, uh, he wants you to hear his words so you can do them and prosper in life. Do you know that God's word is not, you know, people look at it and say, well, that's a bunch of don'ts that I cannot do. The reason why he has those words in there is so you can do them and prosper in life. He's not trying to be a killjoy. He's not trying to like mess up your party or your fun. He's trying to give you life and life more abundantly. That's what God's word wants to do, is give you life and life to the fullest. He doesn't want you to have regret. He doesn't want you to go back and say, you know, I should have kept my mouth shut. I should have let my words be few. James chapter 1, and I'm... ...the doers of the word, and not only hear... Uh, not, Hearers only, deceiving your own selves. For if any be a hearer of the word and not a doer, he is like unto a man beholding. His way and straightway forgetteth what manner of man he was. In other words, he goes and looks in the mirror and forgets what I look like. And you know, we need to not only hear God's word, but we need to do God's word. You know why that's true? It's because when you hear it and you don't do it, you forget it. But when you hear it and do it, now you got two things coupled together, and more, you're more apt to keep doing those things. you got to start somewhere to be able to change that behavior of saying, you know what, I'm not only going to you know, read God's word, but I'll do a God's word. I'm not going to come to church and hear God's word, but I'm going to do God's word. Is this, be not rash with thy mouth, and let not thine heart be hasty to utter anything before God. For God is in heaven, and thou upon the earth. What is he trying to say? You're, he's God, and you're not. And what's the next part say? Therefore, We make all these things. Why? Because we want to make ourselves look good and sound good, right? But remember, verse 19 of James chapter 1 said, Let every man be swift to hear, slow to speak, slow to wrath. Why? Because in verse, the latter part of Ecclesiastes chapter 5, verse 3, it says this, A fool's voice is known by the multitude of words. You have ones out there that are just talking all the time just to talk. I think of, again, politicians, one in particular. Honestly, I think of you know, President Trump. That man loves to hear himself talk. Oh, he loves to hear himself. It's going to be great. It's going to be stupendous. It's going to be the biggest wall. Never mind. Sorry. I mean, that's what he always is. He always wants to hear himself talk. He does. He loves him, himself. Or Abraham Lincoln said it like this. Better to remain silent and be thought a fool than to speak and remove all. You could just listen to them and you're like, yep, that's a fool right there. Because they're going to let you know. There's always that one that's quiet. You never know where they're quite at, but you're going, you know what? You know that they're smart because they're keeping their mouth shut right about now. 
I always think of you know, myself when I was growing up as a kid. I would sit there and, and I would be l- like the fool here. But instead of keeping my mouth shut, I let everything flow out of my mouth and incriminate myself. As opposed to if I just get my mouth shut, come out, and so not only did I get sent to my room, but I also got a whooping, and then also I... Yeah. You know, I didn't want to tell the truth when I was a kid. My wife, she told me this story, and I, I, I've. She liked telling the truth. Is this? She stole a cookie from the cookie jar. No, okay. That she took this cookie from the cookie jar. I could probably add here and say, you know, she felt such conviction of the Holy Spirit and everything else and all, but I don't know if that, but she just felt had a guilty conscience that, remember, Mom, I took the cookie. Mom had no idea. She could have got away with it and just whatever. And she looked at me, and I told her, I said, I would have just kept my mouth shut. I said, I would have been like, boom, I'm done. I got my, I, you know, I got away with it for once. But my wife was, you know, now, I, you know, I'm a little bit more truthful. As a kid, I was like, no, I want to get away with everything I can possibly can. Kids don't. As I, you know, I, I try to tell Lily, and I try to tell, you know, whatever, if you tell us the truth, Punishment is going to be far less than it will be if you lie to us. And that's always, you know, was that what happens? Is that, you know, that if if she lies, she gets, you know, it's worth punishment she does if she tells us right away. I hope and pray that, you know, she's beginning to, to, to tell the truth. And it says this, it says, when thou vowest the vow unto God, Defer not to pay it, for he hath no pleasure in fools. Pay that uh, that which thou hast uh, vowed. Better is it uh, that thou shouldest not. Sin, neither uh, say say thou before. Uh, And destroy the work of thy hands. For in the multitude of dreams and uh, many words there are diverse vanities, but fear thou. And do it. If you've made a, a faith promise that every single month that you're going to take care of a missionary, Don't sit there and wait or hesitate. Do you know why you don't hesitate? Because as soon as you hesitate, then you start, you know, back up and say, well, you know what? I'm going to, you know, um, I, I really need this for this, or I really need it for that. God, I'll get you next month. You know, just in general, like I've seen, you know, I've been a part of churches that have had like building programs and everything else, and people come out and they have like, you know, all these big, you know, grandeur of plans and everything else, and then what ends up happening? Everybody leaves. Praise the Lord that we no longer have a mortgage, amen? amen. That we have ones that are faithful that said, you know what, I'm going to see this all the way through to the end, and have stayed even after the end of the, uh, of the loan as well. But that's what happens. You know, people will come in and they will make these promises. You know what? I will tell you this. I have never regretted tithing to the Lord. This sermon is not about it was to you, but it's not about you giving or anything else. But I'll just tell you this, since I talked about it for a second here. 
I have never. My wallet and go, oh man, I'm this much, you know, you know, if I had only. I spoke on this earlier. We often make a statement. But when we realize the error in, in what we had spoken, we say, well, I didn't mean that. But what is. That it was an error. He's saying, even if you see an angel. All of a sudden, just decide, oh, oh, I'm sorry, I didn't mean it. And you say, well, pastor, so far, you know, this doesn't sound really all that hopeful. There is grace in this. There is grace in the fact that we need to think before we speak. I don't know about you. Maybe you had that from your mom or your dad. My dad, you know, uh, said it not as often, but my mom. reason being is because in verse 8 he talks about he says he says you could see the you know if you see the oppression of the poor and the, the violent perverting judgment and injustice in, in a province he says marvel not at that matter he says, there be higher than they in other words he's saying you know what because you know what god's there god's higher than all of that god's going to take care of all that and what we need to realize is that our home is not here on this earth. This is not our home. We are I, you know, super quick. I mean, the fact is, is that when I, you know, when I was a kid, I couldn't wait to be an adult. And now that I'm an adult, I want to go back to be a kid because, you know what, there was so much less responsibility. Kids, don't be in a hurry to grow up. I'll just tell you that right now. Enjoy the time that you had, to, you know, the, the play and everything else, because then you got to be an adult and then you got to pay bills and then people want stuff from you. The worst thing that you have to worry about your and don't sass back your parents. But it's the fact of money. The Bible talks about the results of a godly, hard-working man versus a rich, wicked man. And the thing is, is that this goes interchangeably, you know, between you know the fact of letting your words be few. You know why? Because uh, proclamations that he has no pro he has no problem dismissing at any moment. He just says, you know what, I made that, you know what, I just said, I just said that just to get the deal done. But somebody who's godly and hardworking and they, that comes out, they are going to stick to their word. Been working, you know, on a house and so many times he's had people come over and say, I'm going to help you on, on your house, help you on your house. And then when it comes down to it, they just leave them in the dust. All these contractors and whatever just don't whatever, but the ones that, you know you know that have you know have been you know hardworking whatever they're like you know what I'm going to come and I'm going to work and I'm going to do my best you know my best work right, and that's what they you know, Paul the king himself is ser uh, is served by the field he that loveth silver shall not be uh, satisfied with silver nor he that uh, loves abundance with increase. This is also vanity. When goods increase, they are increased that eat them. And what good uh, is there to the owners thereof, saving the be uh, beholding of them with their eyes? Here's the thing. Money is for all. It's not just for a select few. This is not going to turn into a prosperity message. I'll tell you that right now. But money is for all and to be used in whatever form it comes by, Right? But here's the problem is, is that it says, he that loveth silver shall not be satisfied with silver. In other words, the one that has a whole lot of money and is all about making money, he's never going to be satisfied with the amount of money that he has. He wants more. 
Or as Timothy says, in uh, you know, 1 Timothy uh, says, in six, uh, chapter 6, verse 10, it says, For the love of money is the root of all evil, which while some covet after, quote this verse when they're referring to the wicked or the heathen or the unsaved. But what does he say? He says, you know what? He says, the fact of loving money. And that's the problem because the Bible says, for the love of money is the root of all evil. So you can be a Christian and fall into the trap of seeking and following after money. So that's the trap that we need, you know, uh, we need to stay away from, is that fact. I'm not saying that you shouldn't be hardworking. I'm not saying that, you, you know, that it's a sin if you make money. I'm not saying that. I'm saying, where are your priorities at? Is your priorities all about the money you're making? Or is your priorities that you're going to put the Lord first, your spouse second, sorry, and then, sorry, then yourself, and then your spouse second, and then your kids, and then your family, and then, oh wait, your church is down here in your ministry. It's when you get it all mixed up and you say, well, no, my job's going to catapult everything and I'm going to put that ahead of everything. That's the problem. It's because then all of a sudden you're never going to be satisfied. That boat that you bought is not going to be big enough. That house that you bought is never going to be big enough. That car is never going to be, you know, as stylish as you want it to be. That brand new iPhone you got, oh, no, I, got, you know, I just got the Pro. I didn't get the Pro Max. Or I got to go get this or this. It's nothing is ever going to satisfy you. But here's the thing. In verse 12, he says, The sleep of the laboring man is sweet whether he uh, eat little or much. Why? He's hardworking. He's diligent. He's doing the things he's supposed to be doing. And you know what? His mind is at peace because he knows that his business dealings are true and honest. He's not lying about it. And it goes on to say, it says, but the abundance of the rich. About. They got all those other things to worry about, and they are never at peace. As I said this last week, and I brought it back this week, is the middle road is better. Not to be poor and not to be rich. Proverbs 30, verse 8 says this. Remove far from me vanity and lies. Give me neither poverty nor riches. Feed me with food convenient for me. In other words, I don't want to be poor. Because we know in Philippians 4.19 it says, But God shall supply all your need according to his riches and glory by Christ Jesus. Do you think that God's riches outweigh the riches of this world? All of our need. And so you know what? Don't give me, you know, I don't want poverty and I don't want riches. I just want what I need. That's all I need. Number three, laboring for the world and what you get in the end. When you labor or you work for the world, this is what you're going to get. Verses 13 through 17, the main one, part I want to focus on. Is verse 15 that says, As he came forth of his mother's womb, naked uh, shall he uh, return uh, to go as he came, and shall take nothing of his labor which he may uh, carry away in his hand. And we look at this the whole thing is, is that no matter how much we have, no matter how much we gain, no matter how much money we store, Get in, you're going to leave that way, and you say, well, I'm going to have a suit on. Well, you know what? Don't matter what, you know, what kind of suit you got on, because it's still going to go in the ground, and the worms are going to eat it. You're like, Pastor, that's a disgusting thought. Well, you know what? It gets a visual, doesn't it? We saw, we read this, you know, just this last Wednesday, 1 Timothy chapter 6, verses 6 and 7. This world, and it is certain we, will carry, uh, we can carry nothing out. So we are to enjoy things that we have on this earth, and I'll get to that here in a moment. Be 
They're laboring for the wind, or essentially they're chasing after the wind. They're going after all this stuff, and in the end, I think a long time ago, I tried to hug, you know, uh, George Washington. I went like this, you know, with a dollar bill. You know what? And it, was just, it, it just didn't feel quite the same as, as giving a, you know, a hug to my wife or my daughter or family. Where is your ministry at? There's no benefit. If you accumulate wealth, it's a matter of where your priorities are. Or it's vanity. This is often, you know, obviously what we see throughout, you know, the book of Ecclesiastes. King Solomon uses vanity of vanities. This like making a little joke out of her saying, I don't know why we're having a service. It's meaningless. I mean, it's just, because that's... You're going, well, what's the point? Why, why even come out? Why even go see the sun today? It's just vanity anyways. It's just... He come to the conclusion of that all of his possession was nothing. The only thing that matters, as we read earlier, is it says, you know, fear thou. Because if God owns the cattle on a thousand hills, don't you think that he can, he can provide for you? We talked about, I said, you know, how many, you know how, many here, how many here love the mountains? Like the love a mountain, like a nice stream coming down, like a deer can come by. You're just like they're on vacation. Hopefully it's not a trophy buck. But he he describes this whole thing. He says, you know how awesome. River coming through. I got one on my phone I could show you. You know, and you look at it and you go. Man, that's beautiful. That's God's creation right there. And as Pastor pointed out, he said, you know what? That's actually not as beautiful as it, as it should be. And it caught me to take it off guard. I'm going, what are you talking about? That's God's creation right there. Hard by sin. And the thing is, is that when we, not until we get the new earth that we, that we shall live on for Ever and ever, are we actually going to see what God's true beauty of all creation actually looks like? So think about that picture and go, you know what? That's when you labor for the Lord and what you get in the end for it. When you're working for the Lord, when you decide to say, hey, you know what, Lord? I'm going to do all my work unto you, and this is what you get for it. Verses 18 through 20 says this, Behold that which I have seen, it is good and comely for one to eat and to drink and to uh, enjoy the good of all his labor. Doesn't Simon... So then to enjoy the good of all his labor that he, he taketh under the sun all the days of his life, which... God gives him, for it is his portion. Every man also to whom God uh, hath take his portion and to enjoy in his labor. Because God answers him in the joy of his heart. That word where he says that it is good and it's comely for one to eat and to drink and to enjoy all the good of his labor, that word comely simply means it's, it's attractive, it's proper, it's becoming. 
So in other words, it's good, it's becoming, it's attractive to enjoy That you've been you know, doing unto the Lord. And this is obviously Solomon later on in his life. So he's looking back. He's saying, you know what? I did this unto the Lord. And he- Very becoming, it's attractive. And note this. You will only enjoy your life. You will only enjoy your labor when you realize that it was a gift from God. When God allowed you to do those things, because there's oftentimes people, you know, as they get up older in age and are not able to do some of the things that they used to do, they begin to miss those things that they once did. Do that still. And when we realize that all the time that we have, all the labor that we have, that we realize that God allowed us to do those things, that God blessed us in those ways, that God says, you know what, that that's what you're supposed to do. When we realize that it is a gift from God, then we can truly enjoy it. And I end with this is, you may not remember much from your life. you in a multitude of times and that right there will bring joy to your heart because god says you know what i want he, he's not about you know like i said he's not about the fact of a bunch of do's and don'ts he wants you to realize that it all comes from him that when we say you know what i am not To you, uh, you know, a lot of times just turn off the TV because all that does is just raise your blood pressure and get you more anxious and nervous about everything. But when we say, you know what, maybe we got to wake up, you know, maybe you got to get wake up three, four o'clock in the morning because you got to get to work. Realize that the job you're going to, the Lord has provided for you, that God has blessed you for that. You say, well, I don't want to see my boss. I don't think my boss is a blessing. You know what, God can use your boss, you know what, to speak into your life as well. No matter how ungodly they are, because you know what, as, a, as the Bible has talked about, God will use an ungodly person to speak into your life. Sometimes he'll do that because of the fact that you don't want to listen to the godly people in your life. But what we need to realize is that when we come before God, especially when we're at church, not to just make vain promises, empty promises to God, saying, God, I'm going to do this and this and this. But you say, you know what, God, as much as I am able to, you know, to, able, much as I am able to do this, and much as you, know, you have enabled me to do it, I will do it. Don't make a promise to God that you can't keep. The Bible says, let your yes be yes and let your no be no. Because we don't want to come before God and, you know, make this and then come back and be like, ooh, man, I should have thought about that before I said that, right? To think about that, because I, I probably just, I probably want to go on, you know, in a hole. And say, you know what, Lord, as you enable me. And God knows that you're going to mess up. I mean, do you expect your children? I mean, yes, it would be amazing. Got less gray hair. But we know that's not going to happen. The same way God says, you know what? I'm going to have to tell you over and over and over again. That's why the Bible says, as many as I love, I rebuke and chasten. God's got to discipline us just like we need to discipline our children. But help us, as James chapter 3 says, you know, Lord, help us to bridle our tongue and let a letter of words be few. Amen? Amen. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, I thank you for your word. Lord, I thank you, God, how your word just always speaks to us. Lord, it is, you know, people say... ...today as it, as it did 5,000 years ago, as it will, you know, from 5,000 years from now. Lord, you know, uh, if you should tarry. And so, Lord, I ask that this morning, help us.
to realize the gravity of our words. That we not be afraid to speak anything, not afraid you know, to, to talk or anything, but help us to, to think before we speak. As it says, Lord, that we would be uh, swift to listen, slow to speak, and slow to wrath. And God, realize that every single day that, that we have, you know, that we're able to do whatever our job is, whatever you've asked us to do, that that is a gift, that is a blessing from the Lord. And Lord, I thank you for this morning. I thank you for those that are here. I ask that as you have brought them here safely, I ask that you would take them home safely. And Lord, may they share the gospel with someone today. And if you should tarry throughout this week, in Jesus' name, amen. One last thing, remember that uh, you know, uh, tonight we have, uh, we have First Youth at 5 o'clock along with our prayer meeting. Then Wednesday night is our, uh, is our Bible study. And then don't forget uh, Pumpkin Barn this Saturday at 10 o'clock. So God bless you. You are dismissed.